Uh, this, friends, is a story that has neither a happy beginning, nor a happy middle, nor a happy ending. It's an unqualified tragedy right through this next 18 minutes. The story is about the heritage of our city of Chennai. I have with me in my hand a 100-year-old book. This was published in 1913, found on the footpath of the Marina Beach, being sold by a fisherman. This actually belonged to a college library before that. College library didn't need books like this, so they gave it to the fisherman to be sold as Raddi. And then he was selling it on the beach. On opening the book, I found that it belonged to one of the most famous lawyers of our city, who was known for his library. And in 1945, when he died, he bequeathed the entire library to the college. College didn't need the book, so it landed in the Raddi. I picked it up, took it home. Whereupon I was asked, how much did you pay for it? I said, I paid 100 bucks. They said, total waste of money. Why do you need to have this kind of nonsense with you? When you open the book, it's the story of a governor of Madras in the 1700s. So the past is forgotten in stage after stage after stage. It comes to a situation where it is not of any relevance to anybody any longer. But when we forget our past, we forget our roots, we become a rootless nation. Once we become a rootless nation, lots of other problems follow as we know. Those who, are con those who forget history are condemned to repeat. This is a very, very oft-repeated statement. This is the reason why some of us began a fight to protect the heritage of our city. We are branded as Anglicans because we support what is ostensibly British culture, British built buildings. We are elitist, upper middle class and upper class people who don't know the sufferings of the common man, who, according to those who demolish these heritage buildings, actually benefit from the demolition. I have never understood how the man on the street benefits from an old building being demolished. So these are all some of the paradoxes that come through in the heritage movement. There is no organized heritage movement in the city. What, is aware, what has made us aware of our heritage is a historian called S. Mutaya and some of his followers. We also have the Indian National Trust for Arts and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, which is an All India body, which has a Chennai chapter. And these are the two forces which kind of help in protecting our city's heritage. Chennai, like any other city, had a lot of heritage. The first time we became aware of a threat to our heritage was in 1985, when this building was slated for demolition. This is known as Bentings Building and this is where the collectorate of Chennai was housed. The collector of Chennai stays in, was, you know, staying in this building. And this was going to be demolished. That is when a group of people got together and said that this is a building that goes back to 1798. It's a classic, you know, style building and you cannot build structures like this any longer. The government was adamant that it should be demolished. One of the easiest things that you can get in India is a certificate that a building is not fit for habitation. Any corporation will give it to you so that you can demolish the structure. So the certificate had been obtained. The building was full of offices at that time. Because the state government was not responsive, a letter was sent to the central government. The central government appealed to the state government, saying that you shouldn't demolish this structure. The state government said, fine, we won't demolish it. They emptied the entire building of all its offices and stopped the maintenance of the building. You know what happens when a building is not maintained? Leaves fall and clog the drainage. Water comes and collects in the drainage. There is seepage through the roof. Windows fall out. Then antisocial elements get into the building. Gradually the building becomes weak and then they give it the same certificate that they gave when it was not fit, when it was not really meant to be demolished. Then the demolition work really starts. This structure was supposed to be demolished in one month. Every staircase took six weeks for removal from the structure. So that is how long it took for demolishing this building. It was not really weak. The architect who was responsible for the new building said, we will build an exact replica of what was originally there. This is what we got. <laughs> Either his eyesight was very strong or mine isn't. Mine anyway is not. So I don't know what this building, how it is supposed to represent the old building. If that was the first story, we then developed the technology of mysteriously having fires in heritage buildings. So overnight, heritage buildings will catch fire. So that is the Spencer Mall that you see on that side. This is the Moore Market that you see on this side. Overnight, they caught fire. And once they caught fire, you know, these are all buildings 
which don't just collapse because of a fire. The woodwork burns down to the ground, but the plaster work, the shell of the building stands and it can be very easily restored and put to modern use once again. But that just never happened and all these buildings were demolished to make way for modern structures which have created further problems of their own. For instance, these are all structures that have natural light, natural ventilation. And if some creative reuse had been done for these structures, the same number of people who are now occupying those buildings could have been put to occupy these buildings as well. But these are all now air conditioned, these are artificially illuminated. Whenever there is a power failure, people are groping around in the dark and it has got all kinds of associated issues. Then in the 1990s, we had some splendid examples of restoration. This, the building that you see on the lower side is the Directorate General of Police building on the Marina Beach. This is a building that goes back to the 1760s. The government wanted to demolish this structure and put up a 10 storey police headquarters on the marina. The heritage activists got together and protested, by which time a certificate had already been obtained that the building is weak and cannot be used and needs to be demolished. So the matter went to the court. A very sympathetic judge then said, we will appoint an independent committee to investigate as to whether this building really needs to be demolished. The committee came together and put together the finding that the building can stand for another 100 years. So the judgment said that the structure cannot be demolished. The police very happily accepted the judgment and committed to restoring the building. They also gave a promise that any extension they do will be built in exactly the same style. And that was followed meticulously and today it happens to be one of the most beautiful structures in our city. Above a building that is very close by is the old ice house. From America, ice used to be imported to Madras between the 1780s till the 1860s when the American Civil War broke out and which is when we got refrigeration in our city. Ice used to come by ships. The ice was stored there. Swami Vivekananda came and stayed there for one week in the 1890s, which is why it became Vivekananda Illam. It played a very important role in the role in the emancipation of women later when it became a widow's home. Dr. Shanta spoke a little while ago. Her grand aunt, Sister Subalakshmi, ran a widow's home there. Today, it's a brilliantly restored building and a museum for Swami Vivekananda run by the Ramakrishna Mission. The University Senate House, supposed to be the finest example of Indo-Saracenic architecture in the whole world, stayed as a storeroom for university examination papers without being used. The corporate houses of the city in 2007 got together, in 2005 got together and said soon we will be having the 150. Uh, 150 years of the Madras University, so we should restore it. Alumni got together, students got together, corporate houses got together. 11 crores was spent in a splendid restoration of the Senate House. After it was restored, it became a storeroom for examination papers once again and is now locked up. It's not used. And pigeons and birds once again continue to roost in it. It's gone back to exactly where it stood before the restoration. Chepok Palace, the birthplace of the Indo-Saracenic style in the whole world, started in 1765, completed in 1767, supposed to be where the idea of building in this style originated. This was how it stood till 1940. This is what you can see of it now, completely covered by the agricultural board building. Inside this, the palace still stands incidentally, the two wings of the palace. And the one wing of the palace caught fire four years ago. And immediately after it caught fire, a minister made an announcement that it will be demolished. So then activists cried, made a hue and cry and then they said, no, it will not be demolished, it will be restored. It is still awaiting restoration. The neighboring wing of the palace had a gaping hole in the first floor and government servants were working around the gaping hole, keeping their files and everything like merry-go-round, you know. Anybody could fall into that hole. Last year, that wing also caught fire. That's, you know, any old building will catch fire if you have files kept over there, old furniture dumped over there and wiring hanging loose waiting for a short circuit to happen. All these things and that also caught fire. So this building is now completely empty, awaiting restoration. We don't know how long it will take. This is the interior of the Chepok Palace. One wing, the other wing and the tower in the middle. Fort St. George has got its own problems. The oldest, you know, structure built by the British in our city, the fort, it's got multiple owners. 
the Tamil Nadu Assembly, the Secretariat, the Army, the Archaeological Survey of India, the Navy, they are all owners of this place. So any restoration attempt has to have all these five worthies getting together to agree on restoration. So we never agree. What we agreed upon is building that 10 storey building you see in that corner within the fort. Can you imagine a modern monstrosity steel and glass being put up inside a 1600, uh, you know, 17th century fort? It was held up as an example of modern Chola architecture. And that is how permission was given for putting it up. Inside the fort you have buildings like this, collapsed and awaiting restoration. Then you have some further examples of good restoration, Rajaji Hall, the old banqueting hall. Today locked up after the restoration, full of government files and furniture. We don't know if it will catch fire sometime. It's a sure enough recipe for that. Next to it was this building, the one of the old 250 year old bungalow where the governors of Madras lived till independence when they shifted to Raj Bhavan. A former chief minister wanted to develop the modern secretariat in this area. We said that there is enough area around this building, at least leave this old building and build the secretariat around it. No, we have to bring it down. Building wouldn't come down, so they finally imploded it with dynamite to get it out of the way. Secretariat came up. After the secretariat came up, government changed. Today, the secretariat is a multi-speciality hospital. So it doesn't fulfill the original purpose for which it was built. The railways in the meantime came up with a magnificent example of what they could do. The old wing of the central station. Next to it, do you see the smaller replica of the central station? Identical structure built in the 1990s. Identical. Today you cannot make out which is the old and which is the new until you go there and see. That is a perfect example of what can be done when you are sensitive to your heritage. Victoria Public Hall, photograph taken in 1905. Photograph taken in 2000. Now this has been emptied. Restoration has been started. We hope that it will be a magnificent restoration. This is Gokhale Hall, the birthplace of the freedom movement as far as our city is concerned. Mahatma Gandhi spoke here. Jawaharlal Nehru has spoken here. Rajaji, Periyar, you name the leader, they have spoken here. Annie Besant built it. The owners of Gokhale Hall, it's a private building. They wanted to demolish it because they wanted to build a multi-storied building with a car parking facility for 10 cars. The width of this road is 30 feet. You cannot have a bigger car park than 10 cars. It really didn't need it. The building wouldn't come down despite the best efforts of the owners to demolish it. This is when the heritage movement took a new turn. This demolition was appealed against in the High Court of Madras. Once the High Court took up the matter, they said, let's make a listing of all the heritage buildings in the city and let's have a committee appointed to do the listing. So the committee worked day and night and they produced a list of 468 heritage buildings. This is not a complete list. In my opinion, truly a complete list of heritage buildings in our city would go up to 2,000 or 3,000 buildings. But a list of 468 buildings was put together. The High Court ruled that none of these buildings can be demolished. A committee of the government has to be appointed which will look into how you can restore these buildings and how the owners can be advised on what they can do with the structures. The committee was entirely populated with government department bureaucrats. It has not taken a single decision in the last six years about any of those 468 buildings. I know personally that 468 has now come down to 460. Eight buildings have gone in the meantime. And if we don't move quickly, most of the other buildings will go. Why do we need to preserve this heritage? What is the purpose? I'll just leave you with this thought. They may be British designed buildings, but they were all built by our artisans, built with Madras technology, Chennai technology. Some of them have foundations on terracotta wells, which nobody outside the Dravidian population knew how to build. And they have been standing for 150 years. The woodwork was built by Tamil artisans. The artwork was done by the local population. The chunamb, that is the chunamb that is used, the plaster that is used is called Madras plaster. Today you don't get that technology. If you want one of the modern plumbers to come and do it, he'll say, sir, it's easier to demolish the building. Why don't you put up a modern structure? I know how to build that. That is the problem. So we are losing what was our own art, our own technology. Secondly, we are losing a quality of life that we may never get again. 
These are all 20 foot ceiling buildings. Every floor is 20 feet in height. You've got natural light, you've got natural ventilation coming in, there is free circulation of air. Sometimes when you open these cobwebbed windows in these government offices, in these old buildings, the sea breeze of Chennai just pours in and takes away all the files through the other window. That is the amount of ventilation that they don't know that they have. So the quality of life of these people will improve. We don't have to adapt or ape a western style of sitting and working just to believe that you know false ceilings and air conditioning is the way out. Why don't we have an alternate style? Why don't we have a Madras style of living or a Chennai style of living even in our government offices? So our entire way of life, our past is vanishing thanks to this kind of indiscriminate destruction of our heritage. The sad point is that many of these government departments do not know how to restore a heritage building. When they are given a heritage building to restore, they assume that it has to be done in the same format in which a new government building has to be built. So they go by the same tendering system, square foot get in a window varuma in the aluminium beading NLA. Where is an aluminium beading going to be used in a government in a modern in a heritage building? Vitrified tile. How can you use a vitrified tile in a heritage building? Using cement, using concealed wiring, building toilets, false ceilings in all these places. These are all the reasons why they are just not aware. In the last one month, we have had three departments of the Tamil Nadu government starting training program for its staff on what to do with heritage buildings. So it's a one small step forward. Hopefully in the next 20 years we will see heritage buildings being restored by the government as well. You know it's a very disappointing exercise. Several of my family members tell me that you will become a manic depressive by the time this whole thing gets over. Well, what are the ways in which we've been trying to fight it? One, we've been continuously writing, we've been representing, we've been conducting Madras Week celebrations every year so that the heritage of the city will come up. Heritage walks have been done by me and by others. Last year, we launched a mobile application called Past Forward, which will alert you if you've got your GPS switched on of all the heritage buildings around you as you walk down or drive down. Then you click on the pin and you'll get 100 words about the building and, the, and a photograph. So you become aware of what is the heritage that is around you. So we are trying to take it into a modern generation. The last, the only thought that kind of sustains us is that the freedom movement did not, was not, you know, over in 20 years. The freedom movement, if it started in 1857, it ended in 1947. It took 90 years for India to become free. Surely at the end of 90 years, India or Chennai will also become heritage aware. And definitely we will have some of those 468 buildings still standing, if not more. So with that hope, we continue to work. Thank you very much for your time.